Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest series of talks. And this one's going to be on the CT evaluation of GI bleeding. This indeed is a very important application that we do see on a daily basis at Hopkins and I'm sure in your hospital as well. Acute GI bleeding is a common medical emergency. Up to 2% of all hospital admissions, uh, more upper GI bleeding than lower GI bleeding. Mortality can be high as 40% of patients with hemodynamic instability. What's interesting about GI bleeding, particularly lower GI bleeding, about three quarters of cases see spontaneously, but in those, about a quarter of them will recur over time. But it does make the point that most patients who present with GI bleeding will have that one episode and will do fine over time. So the key thing for us is to find out why the patient bled and what needs to be done. We typically talk about upper and lower GI bleeding, with upper GI bleeding typically defined as proximal to the ligament of trites, presentation, hematemesis, coffee ground vomiting, or melana. Think about a gastric ulcer. Lower GI bleeding occurs distal to the ligament of trites, melana, hematochezia, positive fecal occult blood tests, or rectal bleeding, or all common presentations. Think perhaps of diverticulitis in GI bleeding as one classic example. In this article by Guglielmo, upper GI bleeding, which originates proximal to ligament of trites, is more common than lower GI bleeding in their series. Small bowel bleeding accounts for up to 10% of GI bleeding cases, commonly manifesting as uh, obscure GI bleeding. Remember, small bowel tumors, for example, can be hard to detect. Uh, evaluation, whether it's with endoscopy or imaging, can be difficult. CT can aid in identifying the location and cause of bleeding and is an important complementary tool to endoscopy, nuclear medicine, and angiography for evaluating patients with GI bleeding. For radiologists, interpreting CT scans in patients with GI bleeding can be challenging owing to the large number of images and the diverse potential causes of bleeding. But again, we need to be very good at it, and I think CT is very good, so it's a question of how you address the problem. Now, if you think about GI bleeding, upper GI bleeding, duodenal or gastric ulcers, varices, gastritis, duodenitis, the rare Mallory Weiss tear, and of course malignancy, be it in the duodenum or stomach or perhaps near GE junction. And when we talk about lower GI bleeding, diverticular disease, diverticulosis and diverticulitis at the top of our list, angiodysplasia is up there, colitis, be it due to ischemia, IBD or infectious are all possibilities, malignancy, think small bowel cancer, think colon cancer, anorectal disease, whether it's fistulae or it's tumor or it's ulcerative colitis, and then of course small bowel disease. Now when you think about upper GI bleeding, it's important to recognize that any patient with suspected upper GI bleeding should typically undergo endoscopy first. It facilitates diagnosis and treatment in the vast majority of patients. Sensitivity and specificity of up to 98 and 100% respectively. You may need um, NG to assess rate of bleeding and for gastric lavage. If no blood and aspirin and no hematemesis, upper GI source for bleeding is unlikely. And CT typically is considered to be inappropriate or not appropriate for patients with upper GI bleeding. Of course, you will remember during COVID when people were afraid to do endoscopy, CT became, in many cases, the primary source of evaluation. Endoscopy is highly useful for diagnosing upper GI bleeding, as mentioned, high sensitivity and high specificity, but that's not always the case. Of course, we also recognize that some patients are unstable and doing endoscopy may not be the study of choice. In this article by Wells, radiologic methods have a role in assessing upper GI bleeds only when upper endoscopy is not feasible or yields inconclusive results. Upper GI endoscopy may be contraindicated in the setting of shock, substantial comorbidities, or massive hemorrhage. Adequate endoscopic evaluation of the bleeding source may not be possible when extensive luminal blood obscures 
visualization or the bleeding originates from a difficult anatomic location such as the distal duodenum. So again, we always will say endoscopy is the way to go, except when it's not the way to go. ACR appropriateness criteria, non-variceal upper GI bleeding. Here's the variant where endoscopy confirms non-variceal upper GI bleeding without a clear source. And you can see 9 is the highest rating, but CT with IV is an 8. Angio is a 9. These days for GI bleeding, you'll get a CT scan. If CT is negative, you'll stop there. If CT is positive, you'll have a good idea what the source of bleed is. And then angiography can be more directed. In this situation here, another variant, non-variceal upper GI bleeding with negative endoscopy. Again, angio and CT in this case are both eights. Uh, for CTA, the procedure is comparable to classic angio and is an alternative to CT enterography. Now, CT enterography is a good study, but again, if I was doing CT enterography with water, of course, I still would do dual phase, and I would still be basically performing it with a CT angio protocol. So it's often CTA and CT enterography kind of merge together when you're looking at uh, occult sources of bleeding. And variant four, per surgical and traumatic causes of non variceal upper GI bleeding, when endoscopy is contraindicated, you can see CT is right up there with classic arteriography. And again, the state of the art is doing CT first. Now, in this article by Guliama, again, active GI bleeding is depicted by the accumulation of extravasated contrast material in the bowel as a focus, jet, cloud, or blush of variable size, usually appearing during the arterial phase. Contrast extravasation generally changes in size, attenuation, shape, and location as we look at later phases. An enhancing focus that changes in attenuation but not shape on later phase images may be a vascular lesion, such as an aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm, so you need to be very careful. The absence of hyperattenuating material on non contrast scans in the same location of possible contrast extravasation uh, helps to confirm active bleeding. Now, one of the questions, of course, in terms of protocols for bleeding has always been do you need to do a non contrast scan? It used to be non contrast and arterial. Well, we found that non contrast really is not necessary. Of course, you can say non contrast arterial venous. But then there's three phases. Of course, the patients are often older, but still we want to do two phases. One of the things we find when you do two phases is sometimes the bleeds are not seen arterial prospectively. They're better seen venous. Also, when you have an active bleed, it changes between arterial and venous. And in those cases, is more likely that endoscopy is going to be positive. Now, you see from this example the importance of technique. When you want to look at the stomach, Good distension is critical. If you want to see a GI bleed, you need to distend the stomach. Of course, you don't want to use positive contrast. You want to use water as a contrast agent. And you can see from these images with cinematic rendering the kind of detail we're able to get, whether looking at the fundus or looking down the antrum. Red is fluid in the patient's stomach. When you're looking for GI bleeding, here's a great example. The patient has ascites. There's high density material in the stomach. You need to be careful, but there is high density material. The reason I say to be careful is patients are often given Malox and you see high density material, particularly layering out by the fundus. You could have ingested matter, maybe the patient ate something. But when you see high density, particularly when it's floating amongst fluid, you gotta be thinking that's blood and you gotta look for a source of bleeding. Here it is on arterial phase. This bright dot, that's blood right there. You can see it again. We always speak about slab MIP imaging as a way of seeing subtle bleeding. Here it is nicely shown. It also shows you nicely the high density fluid in the stomach representing blood. And then as you go from arterial to venous, from here to here, you can see the jet of contrast. This is truly active bleeding. Beautiful example of a jet of contrast.
And here it is again on the coronal views. The coronals nicely again show you the high density fluid in the stomach. We knew it was a GI bleed and now we can see the source of that GI bleed. Another patient, this patient has a GI bleed due to a gastric ulcer in a patient with H. pylori gastritis. Here's the high density zone in the antrum, this thickening here. I guess the one thing you'd be careful about in this case, although I know this is a site of bleeding, I couldn't exclude that it's due to an underlying malignancy, not a very large or bulky malignancy, but I still would worry about an adenocarcinoma. And so this patient eventually will be scoped. Here's a nice example of the same patient, coronal view, the thickening in the antrum, the high density representing the bleed, again, very nicely shown. Another example, this patient was taking NSAIDs, presents with GI bleeding. Look at the stomach, look how thick it is. But then look at the fundus, you see this high density. Again, you could consider on these arterial phase imaging, perhaps the patient was on Malax, perhaps there's something else the patient ingested. But then as you go from arterial to venous, the area of active extravasation, the area of blood increases, and then you're much more comfortable. If it was just simply high density material ingested, it would stay the same between arterial and venous phase imaging. Here it changes in extent, in density, and distribution. Very classic diffuse gastric thickening, and this patient had GI bleeding. Another example, patient presents with GI bleed. There's some high density material in the stomach. Again, with thinking, could this be um, something else, something ingested? Then we look at the posterior gastric wall here, and you see this thickening and irregularity. Something must be going on right there. Now, this could be a cancer, not necessarily a benign gastric ulcer. Here it is on the sagittal view. Beautiful posterior wall thickening. There's an ulcer. So one of the things you can see on CT when you're very careful is a gastric ulcer. And we've shown this before. Here's an article Hanna Recht wrote in radiology, nicely showing you the ulceration in the posterior wall of the stomach. So one of the things cinematic can do is really give you a better view. Here's the wall thickening and there's the ulcer. Remember, you want to be careful not to overcall gastric wall thickening, but in this case, there's an ulcer present, and there's that ulceration in 3D. Just a beautiful view. Again, it's not mass-like, unlikely malignant ulcer, more likely benign ulcer, but you really could not be positive. Again, you can see how I changed the rendering parameters in this case to really give you a really good feel of what we're looking at. And here's that sagittal view again, the posterior gastric wall is thickened. Ulceration, again, very, very important. This article by uh, Oyanagi, recently published in Clinical Imaging, the major complications of acute peptic ulcer disease are perforation and bleeding. Intraperitoneal free air is a major sign of perforation. Intravenous contrast media extravasation into the stomach is a sign of bleeding. High density gastric contents with a suspicion of blood clots can also indicate recent bleeding as I showed you. And although many reports have described CT findings of complicated peptic ulcer disease, the CT findings of uncomplicated disease have not been as well documented. And here's just a nice example. Stomach is well distended. There's high density material in the stomach. You're worrying about a bleed. Look at the antrum, it doesn't appear to be well distended, but here is this, what's this linear air? What's going on there? Well, that's a perforated gastric ulcer. You can see it much better on the coronal view. Here, you know, maybe you called a bowel, you didn't notice it, you assumed it's bowel. Look at the coronal, there's the lesser curvature, there's the wall thickening, there's the break in the wall, there's the air, that's the perforation. This was due to a non-malignant disease. It was a perforated gastric ulcer, but you can see the beauty in this case of seeing the ulceration, seeing the perforation. The 3D mappings are particularly strong in this regard. And here it is with coronal views and volume rendering. However you look at it, cinematic rendering, particularly nice, showing you the ulceration, showing you the high density material in the stomach,
blood being present. The most recognized sign of peptic ulcer disease on a CT scan was high density gastric content. And then of course, this article makes the point not to confuse it with surgical material, foreign bodies, ingested matter, medication. High density gastric contents was suspected of intraluminal bleeding in a study because bleeding was confirmed on endoscopy in up to 93% of patients with high density gastric contents. So again, high gastric density content makes you highly suspicious there's a, can there's a, a process with GI bleeding present. It doesn't mean necessarily it's always going to be the case. Every once in a while, there's high density material is noted for other reasons, but you need to be very careful. In conclusion, we found that the most important CT finding of acute phase gastric ulcer are high density gastric contents, focal luminal outpouching, as I showed you, and low attenuation wall thickening. And again, you can see with the coronals and with the cinematic wall thickening and showing you the ulceration very nicely. So again, a very important use of CT. Now, in this other article, esophageal, gastric, and duodenal cancers can all ulcerate and cause GI bleeding. So it's very important to recognize that when you have a patient with GI bleeding, you need to look at everything carefully. I guess it's in theory possible it could be two sites of bleed. That's pretty rare. But again, you'll look for esophageal cancer, asymmetric or marked wall thickening, often with nodes, gastric cancer, focal diffuse wall thickening, polypoid masses can be associated with lymph nodes or spread to the liver or lung or peritoneum. And finally, gastric lymphoma can manifest as a large mass, ulcerated mass, polypoid lesions, and let's not forget metastasis, be it from melanoma, breast, lung, or even from the kidney. So let's look at one last case of GI bleeding. Here you can see a beautiful example of a mass in the stomach, in the body. There's some high density present, beautifully shown on the coronal views. Again, a very nice example, somewhat enhancing, asymmetric thickening and enhancing. Could be an ulcer, but I have to worry because of the mass effect, it's a malignant ulcer. You can see it very nicely on the coronal views, on the greater curvature. And then here it is again, beautifully shown on the cinematic rendering. This was a classic, classic example of a gastric cancer. Now, in terms of distinguishing METs from primary, and can be somewhat challenging. I'll leave you with this case. Here's a patient with renal cell metastatic to the stomach presenting as GI bleed, polypoid lesions. If you said this was a uh, primary gastric cancer, I would agree with you, but the patient has had a nephrectomy, so you need to th consider the possibility. It's not definitive. There is a mass there, so you know that's the source of bleeding. Endoscopy and biopsy is the way to go but just a beautiful example of METs to the stomach, a number, another cause of polypoid gastric lesion. So I'll show you in these series of talks some METs to the stomach, because people typically think a little bit about lignitis plastica with breast cancer, but they don't consider polypoid lesions, and they surely don't consider renal cell carcinoma. So let's do this. Let's stop at this case, and I want to show you a few more examples, but I know the time is running late, so let's take a break and come back in a few minutes. See you then. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.